this is really intended for folks that may not have um, heard of the MDDDF, and uh, so many um, maybe smaller or newer entrants into the space. Uh, so it's you know at a real one-on-one level, and it's meant to introduce folks to what what's out there, what's been done, and um, give you all a chance to maybe dip your toe into the water and then make a decision about what to do from there. And uh, if you see something you have a question about or interested in, please feel free to follow up with me. All right, so first of all, here's our vision, kind of our North Star when we think about um, the digital supply chain. And this is for over the top video. Um, and it really comes down to the concept that the supply chain should be a, um, a, an enabler, not an, an encumbrance to new ideas, new product features, uh, into new to new launches. Uh, we find that um, very often, or too often anyway, um, a new idea, a new feature, or uh, a new territory launch um, is is kind of slowed down or encumbered by the the realities of actually making it happen in in the supply chain. And you know that's too bad. That's not good for our industry. It's not good for consumers um, when we can't leverage the technology that we have in the way. That we that we want to and take advantage of it to uh, to improve our offerings. So that's really our vision and our goal when it comes to this. So um, starting at the the highest level here, this is sort of the way um, you might think of the the supply chain working as you're just getting started in over the top video distribution. And this is kind of the way we thought about about it about 2005 when I was working at my former employer one of my former employers in this space. And we were launching a, uh, a, an online video service. It was one of the first ones, I think it was the first one actually to go to a, ga a game console uh, and it was in high definition. And so I worked in the business side and this is kind of the way we thought of it. We do deals with content providers. Um, in Hollywood, they would send us files in nice orderly buckets called videos, metadata and XML and artwork in JPEG files. We'd send it through our black box ingestion engine and we'd have a service and it would be great right everybody be able to watch batman forever uh, evidently they can watch it forever um, and money would be exchanged and everybody would be happy and celebrating um what we found out unfortunately about a little too late it was about two weeks before our launch was that it actually looks more like this um, a swirling vortex of Excel spreadsheets, Word documents, PDF files, videotapes, um, all surrounded by people, Excel spreadsheets, and servers. Um, and so in order to get our launch off, and as many of you may have experienced or are experiencing now, if this is kind of new to your space, is that your product launch or your, your, your service launch, that thing's going to happen on the date you said it's going to happen. And that's because you've got PR and marketing. Um, and a lot of folks are depending on you. Your deals are already set that, that, to establish that that's when it's gonna happen. So what happens is you hire a bunch of people or the people that you have, you put them to work um, in operations. And, and so you, know, you find a way to get it done and you give up your holidays and your weekends and your nights and your family and everything else and, and it happens. Um, and you know, there's lots of bruises, skin, knees, broken bones along the way, but you get the thing launched and then you're in the air. Well, um, over time, you figure out a way to get things a little bit more structured. And so at least it's, you have some predictability. It's still a swirling vortex, but you know how big it is and you know what kind of stuff it's spinning off and you're able to have people in the right place to catch it, I guess. And so that kind of, you know, that stabilization happens. Um, and then um, you want to do something else. You want to launch in a new territory or a group of territories, or you have some new features. You want to change all of your artwork. Um, for for all of your titles. And so you set a date to launch, you announce to the, to the press, you do a bunch of marketing, and then about a month before you launch, you realize that you've got a whole bunch more work to do on the operations side that you didn't realize is gonna be so much work, and this happens. Your swirling vortex gets bigger, and it gets surrounded by more people, more spreadsheets, um, and, and more servers. So part of the problem here is that your operations is already in the air. You're flying kind of with a broken wing and half an engine, and but you can't land to go fix it. And and so that's why, like, it's I'd encourage anybody who is um, has not launched yet and you're watching, 
take operations seriously, take supply chain seriously, because it's way harder to fix when you're in the air than before you start. Nevertheless, um, we have some ideas and we've actually made a lot of, um, a lot of improvements on, on fixing this. So how do you fix it? Um, so this is a slide really just to kind of introduce to those of you who, who don't know about it, um, the Movie Labs Digital Distribution Framework, MDDF. Um, and I'll go into some details about the individual specs and standards on our presentation here. Um, but at a high level, uh, it's a set of best practices and standards that have been agreed upon um, by the ecosystem of studios, service providers, and retailers in, or by a, a set of them anyway, in this industry, have been developed by these organizations to meet the needs that they have uh, and the use cases that have been identified. Um, it's a, it includes uh, a veil or rights metadata, uh, content metadata, that's the display metadata that you see when, um, when you open somebody's um, distribution service, um, asset tracking metadata, um, and it's in consistent formats that everybody uh, has agreed to, and in that way it enables automation. So you can have machines talking to machines because they know what they're, what to expect, um, as opposed to people who have to interpret all the stuff they're getting. All right, so it's as I mentioned, it's developed as a collaboration between um, trade associations like Movie Labs, OTTX, uh, EMA, and DEG, uh, major studios, retailers, and video platforms. Um, it's been in use and evolving for over 10 years. The first specification that has been was kind of part of this was actually uh, common metadata, which then grew into the MEC, the um, Media Entertainment Core, and that's the display metadata. It's an XML spec, I'll talk a little more about it, but that was around 2008 that we started working on that. Um, and it's been adopted by major, by major studios for TVOD, SVOD, and AVOD, um, including you know, many of the ones that y'all are, um, are very familiar with, Amazon, Fandango, Google, Microsoft, uh, major studios like Disney, Lionsgate, NBCU, Paramount, Warner Brothers, Sony Pictures, and there's more. In fact, most every studio, whether it's major or um, independent, is using um, the avail specification um, because it's a requirement for some of the major um, platforms. So it's very well um, adopted. All right, so I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about each of the specifications, just to give you a highlight about what they are. And um, they, again, this is just to kind of get you started and there's a whole bunch more um, information available um, that I'll point you to and you can get involved with some of our working groups in the supply chain to learn more. Okay, so first of all, EMA, OTTX avails um, and Titleist. So it's, um, Essentially, the, the purpose of it is to communicate between a licensor and a licensee what has been licensed. Um, and that can be in an SVOD um, use case. So it would be in that case, we would call it a title list. Um, there's different fields that are not relevant in SVOD for TVOD. SVOD, you don't care about the wholesale price. Uh, the start and the end date, the windows are less relevant also in SVOD, but they're available in TVOD. That also obviously uh, meets the requirements of TVOD. Um, it's been widely adopted. It was first released in 2013 and it's available for the use cases, the business models of AVOD, SVOD, and TVOD. Um, there is an XML format and we encourage all of the, um, all of our, um, our, our members and those in the ecosystem to take a uh, careful look at it because it will enable um, a lot more features than the Excel version and also reduce the, um, the friction that is often uh, accompanies Excel. But there is an Excel version and pretty much everybody's using that. Uh, one great thing about Excel is that it's human readable. Uh, and so we'll make this deck available and there's a link in there to the specification. Um, all right, so let's talk about metadata. There's Captain Metadata. And cap, uh, metadata is about, uh, a, a, couple of different um, specifications. I guess here we're just talking about display metadata. Um, this is a really, really well um, burned in specification. It's been around since 2008. Um, it's a subset of common metadata. Um, and it's the, you know, the really the, 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 the most important fields that you would need if you're 
um, launching a service or you have a service to distribute video content um, and the definitions around them. So title, synopsis, uh, contributors, ratings, all that stuff um, has been defined. And so um, what I've found in the experience that I've had with services that are launching is one of the things that we spend a whole bunch of time on in one of my former roles is defining our metadata um, and what, what our display was going to look like. And I mean, literally, we, you know, hours and working sessions and offsites to get this all figured out with engineers and product people. And in the end, if we would have just gone to the MEC, we would have been done because this is, you know, there's everybody from, from Google, Amazon, has already kind of thought through a lot of this over a long period of time. So at least take a look at this. Um, it's, it's a, it can save you a lot of time. It's an XML um, specification also, and it enables a lot of automation in that way. All right, next, um, delivery manifest. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about how this fits in um, when I get to kind of how this stuff all connects, but um, this is a way that you a, a service provider or a studio, someone who's sending content to someone who is receiving content um, can describe what they're delivering um, and how to connect it with what you're supposed to do with it and how you're supposed to display with it, display it. So it's a little bit like a, a delivery manifest that you might get if you were um, receiving an online order and you got a box and you open it up and you wanted to make sure all the stuff you ordered was in it, you look at the list of the stuff that they sent you. So that's kind of what this is for. Um, and I think that that will become, uh, if you are currently receiving lots and lots of assets associated with your avails or your rights, then you understand how valuable it would be to know what things you got versus the things that someone said they sent you or that you ordered. So you can find out if you're missing anything. Sometimes you get stuff that you didn't order. Um, and that's good to know that too, before you publish it and you may not have rights for it. So um, this is also a mature specification. It's widely adopted. It's used by um, the major players in the space. Um, and it's a really in-depth specification. All right, so um, this is a, how, how I'm gonna describe kind of how these pieces connect. So we've got avails, we've got display metadata, um, we've got a manifest, and we've got some assets. So I'm, I'm looking at this from the perspective of a, a digital retailer or a platform who is has avails sent to them so they have the right to publish something uh, and they're receiving assets and then they're going to get them published so um, but the flip side of the coin is the studio all right so start off with rights data so we've talked about this this is your avail so the red text on these slides is the specification and the best practice that has been developed in this part of mddf so you've got avails data that tells you um, what you've got rights to, where you can distribute it, which territory, uh, when, when you can make it available, when you have to stop making it available, um, how much you have to pay for it on a wholesale basis back to your licensor. Um, and, uh, that's for T-Bot, obviously, s doesn't have um, a wholesale price at an individual title level. Um, there's a lot more to it than that. There's over 150 fields in the Excel spreadsheet, but at a, at a high level, that's what it does. Okay, so then you've got your rights data, then your studio partners start sending you assets. So you're getting video files and artwork, um, you're getting some metadata, uh, maybe you're getting dubs, um, that's what that green um, wave is, those are dubs. And, and subtitles, um, and you're getting some metadata I'm representing that here in XML. And so the Media Entertainment Core MEC is the specification, the standard specification for that display metadata. Okay, so the issue here is, as you can probably see, and as I've mentioned earlier, you have lots of assets and they're showing up on your Aspera server, or maybe you've got a drive with a bunch of them on there, and you could have thousands of them, and you've got rights data, and it's over here in a spreadsheet and you don't know how to connect them, right? Because, well, you've got a bunch of file names here and you can kind of read through your spreadsheet and look for um, the, the file that's named Eric's great movie and maybe you can find it, but you've got thousands of them. So it's 
it's pretty tough to connect this. Um, people have tried and are still using um, naming conventions to do this. And so you can set up a rule with all your partners and say, use a title, then have an underscore, then have your language, then an underscore, then a territory, then an underscore, then a, all of that is the way that people have done it. But there's a lot of problems with that. First of all, it's really tough to get it right. And secondly, if you're doing it and other people are doing it, there's no way they're all doing it the same way. So I mean, studios or service writers have to do it a bunch of different times. So I can see you're all nodding on you've been there. So um, how do we resolve this? That's where the IDs are super important. We have IDs in the rights data, and we also have IDs in our manifest. So the manifest is the thing that tells you what you got and what to do with it. And so the way we connect our avails with our assets is through the IDs that are in the specification. So you've got an ALID, and um, that is a topic for another um, lesson. <laughs> um, but suffice to say, that is how you connect what your right is, what you have the right for, with the assets that you're receiving. And it works like this. So now you know what to do with the stuff you have. All right, so we talked about avails, um, delivery manifest, and MEC for display metadata. There's um, a few other um, specifications and best practices. We have um, media delivery core, and this is a, a new spec that was just completed last year. Um, and this is a way that allows the ecosystem to describe and communicate about detailed level asset ordering and tracking. So if I'm a retailer and when I launch in, when I publish in Switzerland, I want German, French, Spanish subtitles and dubs. Um, and I want those as separate components to be able to connect and create a, a user experience that allows users to shift between them. Um, I can convey that with this specification. Uh, on the other hand, when I'm maybe publishing in Mexico, I only want and want to pay for um, Latin Spanish subtitles and dubs. And it's not worth it for me to get uh, the German, Portuguese, Italian, whatever else. Um, so I can communicate that differences, those differences through this, um, which is important. Now, the way that's done now often is with um, sticky notes. And um, I mean, there's whole teams that are devoted to keeping track of and trying to remember what the requirements for each retailer are. Um, at the various studios. So this can really help with that. Um, content ratings, um, this is something that I think there was some discussion about earlier in the panel that we had on um, international distribution and expansion. Content ratings um, are like really, really important when you're distributing globally and it's important to get the right ones. These won't help you get the right ones, but it will tell you what they are, what the right ones are. Um, and so we've worked and we continue to work with the industry and with those that are distributing uh, internationally to update these, they change. Uh, there's new ratings added, there's new reasons added, um, there's new uh, regulatory bodies that get added. And so we continually work on updating this. Um, and, you know, it's a great source as you're going international to consult uh, as to know what the, the rating systems are and what the ratings values are. Um, QC vocabulary, uh, also released last year or a major update released to it last year. Um, when you're QCing video and, and to, to publish it, there's invariable things that go wrong. There are many things that can go wrong. We added 300 things to this list just last year. Um, and it would be great if we all use the same words for them. So if someone said ghosting, um, you might know what it meant, um, as opposed to a, some other form, form of, of glitch that you might see. So using a word like glitch is not super specific. We'd prefer to use aliasing. Uh, we had a great time with this QC vocabulary group. It was very geeky and, uh, and we enjoyed talking about strange terms like snitch and crackle. Um, the last one is eider. So eider is not part of um, the, I don't know, maybe it is part of MDDF. Um, let's just say it is for now. I'm sure Will will tell me. Um, but it's a super important identifier, um, and it's uh, the only registry that we actually have for, um, for audiovisual works that are in the long, long form space. 
and uh, no, actually short, short form. Um, it gives us the ability to um, connect whatever we get in terms of a title um, or an asset. If we have an IDR for it, we can connect it with the IDR registry and confirm or know what it is. Um, and that's hugely valuable, um, especially when, when you want to connect with other, um, other services and other platforms outside of your own. Um, it's been a big benefit to our industry and um, we're 100% um, well, very grateful that it's there and really want to promote it for all of those that are entering the industry now um, to learn about IDER and uh, reach out to get some more information and um, we'll, uh, we'll de definitely point in the right direction. Um, let's see. So I think I'm about done. I've got a little more time. These are some more resources. As I mentioned, I'm going to send this deck out to everybody. Um, we did record this as well. Uh, when I send it out, you'll be able to get to these individual um, websites and links. Feel free to email me um, and head up to the movielabs.com site and the ottx.org site. All right, so with that, I think I have time for some questions. Um, does anybody want to ask me a question? I might ask somebody else a question if I don't get a question. <laughs> 